All right. So as everyone knows, Hamas launched a massive uh, attack into Israel. In fact, there's been such a loss of life um, without a war being declared that it's so bad that, that people in Israel are actually comparing it to their 9-11. And obviously, everyone is talking about this. Everyone is providing analysis with respect to the motivations behind Hamas, the motivations behind Iran, what Israel's response is going to be, what this is going to be for what had been uh, a series of successful peace talks within the Middle East with the Abrahamic Accords. And we're going to touch on some of that. But one of the things that we wanted to do today that is a little bit different is, is we wanted to focus a little bit more on some of the arguments that are coming up because a very interesting, let's say, intellectual battle is taking place on the left within the United States and within a lot of the Western world. And it's, it's revealing some intellectual divisions uh, that could be very, very significant. So we are going to talk about, again, what has taken place, what it means for the region, what it perhaps means for the United States. But there is another argument here that we just don't feel a lot of people have been covering on right now that is, let's just say, interesting because it could show us the potential path that the left is going to go in the future. And we're going to talk about all of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument, powered by Good Ranchers. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We would love to continue the conversation that we're having today in our community. If you're not a member already, go down to the link in the description, hit that join button. We would love to get to know you there and have you participate. All right. As always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates for now. I have to say that because I'm up for re-election. Who knows? I might not be it anymore. But other than that, a reasonably good guy. With us not today is my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. She's actually doing some preparation work. We got the Homesteaders of America conference coming up this weekend that we're pretty excited about. And so she is getting us all ready for that. But we do have our resident historian, political prognosticator, and mostly benevolent warlord in training, Christian Heinz here today. How you doing, Christian? Uh, I'm doing okay. How about you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing, and then, of course, our producer <laughs> of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. So this is a pretty, um, I mean, it's a pretty serious topic, a pretty somber topic. Um, let's go ahead and go with our, our first uh, first article here. And interestingly enough, we're going to look at one from Al Jazeera, and we're also going to look at one from, I think it's Jerusalem Post. But um, what it talks about here, and if you scroll up a little bit, the irony of using Al Jazeera as a news. Well, source. again, part part of the part of the process here is to figure out what are they saying, because I'd like to know if this is fairly objective content or whatnot. So, the the title of this article is "What Is Happening in Israel?" and a look at the war and a war with Hamas. And so, if you scroll down here a little bit, it says Israel on Monday threatened to track down and punish Hamas fighters who announced in a total blockade of the Gaza Strip following a surprise weekend attack by the armed Palestinian group. And scroll down a little bit more. Okay, about six thirty a.m. Uh, many or that's 3:30 uh, GMT. Many Israelis woke up to sirens after rockets were fired from the Gaza Strip. Hamas said it launched 5,000 rockets, and in its initial barrage, Israelis Israel's military said 2,500 rockets were fired. The strength, sophistication, and timing of the morning attack apparently surprised Israel, which has one of the world's most high-tech intelligence setups. Hamas fighters crossed from the Gaza Strip into southern Israel with motorcycles, pickup trucks, paragliders, and speedboats, and attacked 22 locations. Hamas's military Military commander Mohad Daif called the operation Al-Aqsa Storm. Hamas spokesperson Khalid uh, Kodami told Al Jazeera that the group's military operation was carried out in response to a spate of provocations by Israel, Israeli politicians and settlers at Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque, among Islam's holiest sites, and to decades of violence and discrimination suffered by Palestinians at the hands of Israel. Um, and if you look at here, it's like how the uh, Hamas attack, uh, attack unfolded. And what this does is it, sh it shows a, a map. Scroll down. Now, this is this is where it gets interesting when you talk about Al Jazeera versus um, for their other news outlets. But what you're seeing here is um, it's it's a list of of strikes, a list of rocket attacks that took place within Israel. And then again, in Al Jazeera, they don't describe it as the West Bank. They describe it as the occupied West Bank and the occupied East Jerusalem. And then you have the Gaza Strip, which is right there along the Mediterranean Sea um, by both uh, bordering both Egypt and Israel. Um, so multiple rocket attacks, multiple gunfights. Um, of course, one of the most, uh, you know, one of the ones that's been talking about the most is this uh, festival that was taking place in the desert. It was a music festival for which uh, apparently um, hundreds of people were killed and several more were carried off as hostages. And the idea behind that was Hamas was 
they, they conducted their initial raid into Israel. They captured a bunch of people and then they brought them back into Gaza. And now they're strategically placing them in locations that they believe that the Israeli military might um, retaliate against. And so they're essentially using them as human shields. Scroll down a little bit more. Uh, how did Israel respond? In response to the attack, Israel launched what is called Operation Swords of Iron, which its jets, uh, with its jets bombing the Gaza Strip. We are at war and we will win, Netanyahu said in a televised statement on Saturday. He said the military would use all of its strength to destroy Hamas's capabilities, but he warned this war will take time. It will be difficult. Um, he said, get out of there now. He told Gaza Strip residents who have no way to leave the tiny overcrowded Mediterranean territory of 2.3 million people, which is blocked by Israel by air, sea, and land. That's actually not totally true. This is where you get the Algeria, Al, Al Jazeera uh, component of this. There's plenty of places that people from Gaza could go. Um, there, there's multiple Arab countries that could actually take them as refugees. And last time I was told by the left is you, you have a duty to take refugees. Well, now we're talking about refugees who, in, in large part, uh, at least have a, a very close religious ties to all these other countries. And in many cases, they have ethnic and religious ties to the various countries that they could get into, um, that they, they could be taken. Like if Egypt said, Hey, we'll, we'll take them. We'll take them right now. We'll take any, we'll take any civilians that want to leave and remain safe. They could go, but Al Jazeera is conveniently leaving that out. Let's go to the next clip. This one's from the uh, Jerusalem post. You're going to see an, an obvious difference in, in the reporting here. Um, scroll up just a little bit. Um, okay. So they, they asked this question, is this the worst Israel-Hamas fighting? Hamas, a Palestinian terror group, has launched attacks on Israeli civilians for decades and has governed the Gaza Strip for more than 15 years. It's important to understand that you have two areas of, of Israel right now that are, are kind of like this quasi-Palestinian state, right? You have the West Bank, which is parts of eastern Jerusalem and a lot of this area in between. Um, kind of like in the north, you got the Sea of Galilee. In the south, you've got the Dead Sea. Uh, you've got the River Jordan. Um, but th that, that area right there is under the administrative control of, uh, the Palestinian, Palestinian liberation organization, uh, which has since come out and, and let's just say it, it is definitely softened its approach with respect to, to violence. Whereas Gaza has been run by Hamas for 15 years and, and Hamas is listed as a terrorist organization. Um, so there, there's some differences with respect to how things have, have been conducted within the West Bank versus how things have been conducted in, in Gaza. So during that time, this is this is Gaza Strip, the area that's controlled by Hamas, has launched 15 barrages of missiles in Israel's cities and on the Gaza border and beyond, sending residents fleeing for shelter. And Israel has responded with airstrikes and offensive strikes that have killed thousands of Palestinians in the coastal strip. So again, even the Jerusalem Post, the Times of Israel, sorry, Times of Israel is saying that, you know, yeah, it's, it's killed thousands of Palestinians in the coastal strip. So this idea, because... You know, somebody mentioned in the comments, like, why is it Hamas killing Israelis, but Palestinians just die? I, I don't know where you're hearing that because everywhere I hear the, 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 if you, if you look at how most of these conflicts or how most, if you look at the Israeli response to most of these conflicts, the Israelis seem to, at the very least, attempt to project out to say, look, we just got hit. We're going to strike back, seek cover or you know, stay away from military targets or, or whatnot. And then Hamas deliberately places civilians or military strategic military targets in the close proximity of things like hospitals and schools. And so I, I find it incredibly disingenuous for Hamas to launch surprise attacks and to directly target civilian, civilian targets. And then when Israel responds, well, then all of a sudden Israel's being cruel See, this is one of the problems is that within warfare, within conflict, there will always be collateral damage. But for people to act like the entity directly and deliberately targeting civilians is the same as someone is the same as the entity that is deliberately attacking legitimate military targets and then civilians get wounded or hurt or killed as a result, as if those two things are the same thing because a civilian died is horribly intellectually dishonest, horribly intellectually dishonest. And, and it's amazing because you certainly didn't see the left taking this position in, in other conflicts. This is, this is one of those situations where when it suits them, they take a particular position, and when it does it, they immediately abandon it. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll stop right there. A couple of concerns that people have brought up is that, one, the Israeli military and the Israeli intelligence system, uh, both the Mossad and, and other in, in Israeli intelligence apparatuses, are, are really known for being 
kind of cream of the crop uh, across the world, uh, not just within the region, but actually being being highly effective. Um, there, there's been a lot of uh, work on this. There, there was a book called Every Spy a Prince, which actually goes over the history of the Mossad. And, and it's not to say that any intelligence agency is perfect. I mean, obviously, the Yom Kippur War uh, took the Israelis by surprise as well. And this actually was done 50 years to, I think, to the day or the day after at the anniversary of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. It was 50 years the day after the anniversary. It was also um, the first 24 hours of the of of the and I'm I'm just going to call it terrorist attacks. I don't yeah. really care if people disagree. That's fine. We're we're going to get into that in this episode. But it, uh, the first 24 hours of these terrorist attacks were the most number of Jewish people killed in any single event since the Holocaust. Yeah. Would people and and a lot of times people see that they'll see. I think it's I think it's over right around nine hundred deaths so far. I think initially it's, it's it was, creeping up to about a thousand. Yeah, now. initially it was a few hundred, and people were like, "Well, that's a that's a few hundred deaths." It's like, okay, but you need to understand if you look at the population of Israel and you compare that with the population of the United States, what what Israel just went through would have been the equivalent of the United States losing twenty five thousand people in in a you know matter of hours, right? That's you, you, we need to put that in the proper perspective. And I, I know we had one question in here from Grant. He goes, uh, has Israel done anything to provoke Hamas's attack? Well, Hamas certainly seems to think so. The question that you have to ask yourself is, is this, because there's a long history here, right? There's a long history. And anybody that's looking at what, what has just happened within the last you know, couple of weeks um, it is, is not going to get the full picture of, of why the Israelis do some of the things that they do, why Hamas and the Palestinians do some of the things that they do. So, they list it off as the reasons why is because of, of settlement issues. Um, I, I honestly think a lot, of, a, a lot more of this was motivated by the fact that Iran realizes that it's in somewhat of a, a weaker position than it's been in a long time in the Middle East, in part because of things like the Abrahamic Accords. Um, during the last presidential administration, we were actually seeing progress within the Middle Eastern peace process that we hadn't seen in a long time. And part of that was because more and more nations, more and more Arab nations within the Middle East um, were, were starting to uh, you know, create friendlier relations, not friendly relations, but um, softer relationships w- with Israel. And, and part of that, I think, was motivated by the fact that Iran is actually seen as a significant threat to a large part of the Arab world. Um, I, I, Iranians are not ethnic Arabs. And then I, the Iranian government is also primarily Shia, where most of the Arab world is Sunni, with the exception of uh, Iraq, which happens to be heavily influenced by Iran. And so I, I think Iran saw this as an opportunity to interfere with what what is, again, what has been positive signs within the Middle Eastern peace process. So can, can Hamas come up with excuses for, for why they would attack Israel? Uh, sure. But here's my question. If, if someone were to attack the United States and then we were to respond by deliberately, by deliberately going in, murdering civilians, I, I don't mean, I don't mean accidental collateral damage. I mean, our soldiers went in with the direct intention of murdering civilians, capturing them and then bringing them back so that we could place them in strategic locations in order to put Israel on the horns of a dilemma that if it responds to our attack, it could potentially kill its own citizens that have been kidnapped. Right. I, Look, I, I don't I don't know what Hamas thinks Israel might have done in that time to provoke an attack. If I, I, I will look at it this way, I don't think Israel did anything to provoke an attack of, of this nature. I don't think it did anything to provoke a military attack. But even if but if Hamas wanted to make the argument that it was, and Hamas decided, hey, we're going to attack an Israeli checkpoint, that would at least be attacking a military target. But carrying off grandma to the Gaza Strip so that if Israel responds, grandma potentially gets killed. I, I no, I don't think Israel did anything to provoke that. And and I don't I don't mean that to be flippant toward you who asked the question. I'm just saying that I, I've seen some of these arguments before where I, I am perfectly satisfied whenever we're looking at a conflict because war is horrible. I know I've been, I'm perfectly happy. We look at a conflict to, to, to not look at it through the rose colored glasses of whoever I agree with is right all the time and never does anything wrong. I think it's perfectly appropriate to say, okay, what could have been potentially the impetus for attack? What could have been the impetus for a response? Uh, was the response legitimate? Was there, you know, the, the appropriate measures taken in order to try to prevent the loss of, of innocent human life or prevent collateral damage? These are all fair questions. These are all fair questions. But at the end of the day, we also understand that we're working in an imperfect world. And one of the things that I think is so frustrating for someone to me that's that's viewing this, who again has been to war, is that it is intellectually disingenuous to say 
that when when Hamas launches this attack, right? When Hamas launches a surprise attack, directly targets civilians, holds them as hostage. We we have video of what appears to be you know murder, rape, parading bodies of civilians through the streets, and then Israel responds to to make it look like well you know hey there's there's bad guys on both sides like okay I'm I'm sure that could potentially be true, but that doesn't take away from the overall fact that one side is far more justified in their response than the other side. And and I think that's the way that we've got to look at it if we're being intellectually consistent within an imperfect world, right? I don't, I don't see, you know, anybody on the left going, well, you know, there were some good guys on the Russian side too when they invaded Ukraine because Russia, Russia invaded Ukraine. They're the ones in great engaging in an aggressive action against Ukraine. And regardless of what you feel about how involved the United States should be in that process, and I've said this before, I don't think the United States should be the ones primarily responsible for spending treasure and definitely not blood in defending a country for which we have no long established treaties or relationships with. I don't think that's an I don't think that's an unreasonable position, but I can also hold that position while simultaneously hoping Ukraine expels the Russians because I don't think the Russians engaging in an aggressive land grab was a good idea. I don't think that's moral either. So two things can be true at once. All right. So next thing that we're going to go over here, and this is just for perspective, because what we're really going to focus this episode on is is talking more about what are some of the arguments that we're seeing within the West with respect to Hamas and, and Israel? Uh, because that's, that's interesting. And to a lot of us, I think it seems counterintuitive. And what's really fascinating is it's becoming counterintuitive to a lot of liberals. And we're going to make a distinction here between liberal and leftist. But the first thing I want everyone to do just to get a proper context, historical context of that area that we call the Levant, right? Which is where Israel is, where Gaza is, where the West Bank is. Right when we talk about the Levant, that's the, it's this geographical area um, that's right there on on the the Mediterranean coast in um, in Asia. So <laughs> because because you're going to see a lot of context about uh, apartheid states and decolonization and occupied territories. So go ahead and scroll uh, up to the top here, Hamilton. I, I want to show somebody what we're talking about here. All right, so when we're talking about like the third millennium, so we're, we're talking about 3,000 years before Christ, right? 3,000 years before Jesus is born, we have the land of Canaan, all right? This is not Arab ethnicities necessarily. You, you, have, a, you have a combination of various maybe Semitic peoples, Hittites, Egyptians, Phoenicians. I was going to say there were some Phoenicians in the north. Yeah, um, so scroll down. So we're going to kind of slowly scroll down through here, Hamlin. So you have the land of Canaan, all right? And then this is also when Abraham actually came in and started to settle. Abraham immigrated, right, to Canaan, which, which I was told immigration is a good thing. Scroll down. All right, then you have a period of upheaval. This is where you actually had a lot of fighting over the Levant, over this area of Canaan between the Egyptian empire and the Hittite, Hittite empire, all right? Again, no, no Islam, no anything like that, just the Egyptian empire, the Hittite empire. Then you have the Israelis appear on, on the screen. And you have, the, you have, first of all, before you even get into the Israeli kingdom, you have the judges period, right? This is where you have the 12 tribes occupying this area. They move out the, the Canaanites. Um, and now they're, they're occupying most of this area except for actually the area around Gaza, which was largely controlled by uh, Philistines, who, are, who a lot of people now think in the Bronze Age were probably the Sea Peoples. There was some, probably some Greek ancestry and ethnicity with respect to uh, certain Philistines. Scroll down. All right, so now you have the kingdom of Israel. So you go from the judge period to the kingdom of Israel. This is where you get, this is where you get King Saul. This is where you get King David. This is where you get King uh, um, Solomon. Scroll down some more. Then you have the kingdom split. After Solomon, right? Then after that, what do you have? You have the kingdom of Judah in the south. And you have the kingdom of Israel in the north. Scroll down some more. What's going to happen over time is kingdom of Israel is now captured by Syria or the Assyrians. Sorry, the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, is you have the lost 10 tribes of Israel. So you have one of your first diasporas where basically there had been this long time where Israel had almost been operating as something of a client state to the Assyrians. They finally got sick of it, destroyed it and started moving uh, the Jewish people throughout the Assyrian empire. Scroll down some more. Later, you have the fall of Judah. This is where the Babylonians come in. They, they take Jerusalem, right? They, they kill the last king of Israel. They butcher his sons in front of him. And then they take uh, most of the Jewish people, especially the ones that um, you know, worked in the court, were educated. They take them back to Babylon. 
And again, for, for biblical reference, this is where we talk about like Daniel in the lion's den, Meshach, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, stuff like that, right? This is Nebuchadnezzar, et cetera. So you still have Jews living within this area, but it's been significantly reduced and they no longer have any sort of political power. And, and ba- ba- the, the Babylonian Empire controls directly controls this territory in this time. Yes. And that continues until... Yeah, scroll down some more. The Persians come in. And then the Persians come in, right? And they take the area from the Babylonians. Scroll down some more, and then guess what happens? And the Persians rule it until Alexander the Third of Macedon ends up uh, defeating and Darius. Alexander the Great comes in, defeats Darius, takes over. And, and what's interesting is Alexander the Great actually takes portions of the Levant before um, finally... Um, so he goes to Egypt. Yeah, he goes to Egypt. So after Alexander the Great, you have what is called the War of the Diadochi. And by the way, if you ever want to listen to a cool podcast on that, Christian started one called uh, King of Kings and it was about Persia after Alexander. But the War of the Diadochi kind of ends with the Seleucids, um, now the Seleucid Greeks now running this part of the world. Right? Seleucus was one of Alexander's generals and he ends up emerging victorious in yeah. certain parts of the empire. But the empire gets permanently split, right? It's, yeah. it's divided up amongst his generals. But one of his generals is Seleucus and he establishes is a empire that encompasses basically the entire region and not entirely though it's actually worth pointing out that he ends up fighting the ptolemies who's uh, they control egypt ptolemy which is another one of alexander's generals establishes his own kingdom in egypt and the seleucids and ptolemies actually fight like 200 years plus of on and off warfare over syria it's called the syrian wars yeah but even though it's called the syrian wars a lot of the fighting actually takes place in modern day israel the west bank gaza and so, so that we, entire region is actually contested heavily between the two of them yeah. for hundreds of years until you get to like the Maccabean revolt. Yeah. So what you have at that point is now the Romans come in, right? So the Romans are now controlling the area. And this is where you actually first uh, see, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Christian, this is where you actually first see the area being referred to as Palestine, because essentially there's several Jewish revolts that are that are put down during this, but very brutally put down. Um, there, there's a couple of, I think, uh, History March and maybe Kings of Generals actually have a really good uh, video that you can watch on the fall, the siege and fall of Jerusalem or one of the sieges and fall of Jerusalem. Hadrian finally just massacres, like really commits like genocide against the Jews in this area. He's the reason that the Jews don't exist in large numbers. They still exist to some degree, but they don't exist in large numbers for hundreds of years later. I mean, he, he, he's the reason that people call it ancient Palestine. Yeah. So he's the one that changes the name to Palestine away from Judea as basically kind of an, uh, a slap in the face to the Jews. He also renames Jerusalem. I think he renames it uh, Alia Capitolina or something like yeah. that. He he basically tries to erase Jewish history and culture from the region. Yeah, that, that's how that's how mad the Romans were at, at the Jewish revolts. Then after that, you have the Roman Empire splits up between the uh, Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. Eastern Roman Empire becomes known as Byzantium. And then you have these conflicts going kind of back and forth between the Persians and Byzantium, where sometimes the Persians control the region and the Romans take it back. And then what ends up happening is is the um, Byzantines and the Persian Empire essentially just beat the crap out of each other. And that is where you actually have the first Islamic conquest taking place in this portion of the world. Immediately afterwards. Yeah, so like in, in this six, 600 AD is when you start to see the first, um, a, a lot of the, the Arabic tribes coming out of the Arabian Peninsula um, you know, conquest and it's conquest in the name of Islam. And then after that, you get this, uh, there's a series of caliphates, right? You have the, you have the um, Umayyad caliphate, you have the Abbasid caliphate. You have the Rashidans first. You have the Rashidans first. Yeah, I'm not doing an order. I'm just <laughs> saying that, you know, you get uh, Umayyads, uh, Rashidans, uh, Sassanids. Um, no, no, the Sassanids were the Persians. Oh, sorry, sorry. You're right. Sassanids were Persians. Sorry. See, this is where the, this, the, this is where the Rashidans community. wiped out after the Battle of Al Qadisiyah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a huge nerd about Persian history, but yeah. but the, the the point is is that you have various caliphates that are represented by different ethnic groups. Like it would be inappropriate to think that every caliphate or every um, Islamic empire at this time is, is ruled by the same ethnicity. That's not necessarily the case. Um, and then. What this eventually turns into over time is you have the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire controls this area for a long time. The Ottomans are, are largely Turkish and, and, and Ottoman uh, eth- uh, ethnically. And then you have World War I. And when World War One takes place, uh, the Arabs, uh, there's there's an Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire. They work largely with the British. This is where you get that, um, you know, the whole idea of, um, oh, dang, I just forgot the movie, Lawrence of Arabia. Um 
uh, which is a great movie, by the way, and, and a great example of unconventional warfare. But they go out there, and then what happens after that is um, you start to see this portion of the Middle East being broken up between, pr- predominantly between the British and the French. And the British end up kind of inheriting the Levant and the Transjordan, and, and they are setting up this area, and they, they call it Palestine because that was the original Roman name for it. Um, and, and you have the Transjordan. When World War II takes place, Obviously, you have the Holocaust. You have the entire world that is is feeling understandably and you know somewhat guilty and 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 responsible. Um, maybe not responsible, but, but guilty about what happened to the Jewish people because this was not the first time that major European cultures and and entities had actually engaged in. Um, you know, things like pogroms uh, against the Jewish people. You saw this in, in Russia under the czars where, where they pushed out uh, the Jewish people um, and, and you had more widespread diasporas. But obviously what happened in the Holocaust was on an entirely different level of very, very targeted brutality toward the Jewish people. Well, at this time, um, more immigration had been taking place since the British took over this part of the world. More Jewish immigration returning to, you know, the Holy Land, uh, returning to what they obviously and understandably consider their ancestral homeland and to an area for which they had never been entirely removed from. Um, they started to go back down. They start to buy property. They start to set up kibbutz. They start to set up, um, you know, farms, agriculture, and things like that. And these are largely going, you know, through on, on again, peaceful transactions. This isn't, you know, Jewish armies coming in and taking over parts of this area. Um, however, the British are very concerned about this. Uh, the Arab population that are currently in the country, they're not especially happy about it because this is also where you start to see um, more of a rise in certain strands of, of Islam, which are much more openly hostile toward the Jews than previous um um, so like, I don't know if you want to call it denominations. It's, it's, of it's worth noting that like some of the caliphates, believe it or not, were actually incredibly tolerant. For example, the early Muslim rulers in Egypt ruled over a majority Christian population for hundreds of years. It wasn't until the 1300s that that Egypt, a majority of them had converted to Islam. So yeah. for like 600, 500 years, Egypt was ruled by a, a um, ethnic and religious minority. And the Islamic rulers, early Islamic rulers, this is way before like Wahhabism and the yeah. Saudis and stuff like that, were actually much more tolerant. For example, um, the Jewish people that had been dispersed into Europe under the Romans after Hadrian, and and you know, so, so you get millions of Jews that are are living in a diaspora across Europe in the early Middle Ages, and late antiquity. A lot of them actually found more tolerance among the um, the Caliphate in Cordoba. Um, under the Umayyads, after they had been expelled by the Abbasids, the, yeah. the, the the Muslims ruled Spain still until the Reconquista ended in the 1400s. Um, the Muslim rulers in Spain were actually incredibly tolerant towards Jewish people. So historically, there was actually for a long time, until probably until the last 500 to 300 years or so, there you could easily make the case that depending on the country you were comparing it to in Europe— Muslim rulership in parts of the Middle East were actually more tolerant of Jewish people. And obviously you've seen a, in some ways a reversal of that after the advent of, of things like Wahhabism and these, these very fundamentalist strains of Islam that have gained a lot more popularity. And it, it, Wahhabism isn't the only one, of course, but that's the more, that's the more common one that you see in the modern age. So it's, the reason I bring this up is because it's complicated. We're talking about a very complicated yeah. subject here yeah. that, that spans thousands of years of history. There were a few people in the comments a lot of new people that are listening today that don't might not know who you or I are super well, Nick, but there was somebody in the comments that's like, well, you know, Jewish people have only been living there since 1948. That's, yeah, that's, that's not that's true. Not, that's They've not been true. living there for over 3000 years. Yeah. Um, I mean, arguably they've been living there for, you know, close to 5,000. Um, and, but, it, but again, there has not been, there has not been an Israeli or a Jewish state in Israel since that. I mean, you, you could, you could argue that at various times when you had like Herod the Great, there was, um, there was still what you might call a Jewish state, but it was a client kingdom. But, but that, that still would have been, that still would have been considered, especially at that, that time in history, very, very common. The, the important thing to remember here is that in, in 1948, that is when you had, um, that is when you, the UN tried to strike an agreement, right? So you, you had the, the UK that wanted to be able to set up a, a portion of the area that would, that is, you know, uh, then referred to as Palestine set up into a Palestinian state and a Jewish state. Um, 
the Israelis agreed to it, or the, the Jews at the time agreed to the argument they were going to call the state Israel. They agreed to it. Uh, the Arab countries did not. And, and neither this, did the Palestinians. Yeah, and neither and neither did the Palestinians. And 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 again, when you, I, I almost find the term Palestinian kind of uh, kind of interesting because again, it was a, it, it was it was a Roman that gave him gave it that name. That wasn't like some sort of historical namesake for the area, other than the Romans doing it. But that's okay. That's fine. So, the the Arab the Arab countries and the and the and the Arabs currently living in that area and the Muslims currently living in that area uh, for the most part did not agree to that. And so you had a war break out almost instantly between the Jews and Palestinians, as well as um, armies that were coming in from the trans- virtually the entire Arab world. Yeah. The, the trans Jordan uh, military was probably the best trained and equipped at that point, but the Egyptians were also involved. The Syrians were involved. And what, what happened over that 48 day period is, is you actually had a lot of back and forth fighting. Um, and eventually what happened is there was a ceasefire. And during that ceasefire it was actually, I think the Czech Republic, which just sent down all kinds of weapons and, and equipment. You actually had people from the Jewish diaspora all over the world sending in equipment for, for the Israelis to be able to fight. And Israel actually was able to um, expand off of the uh, original borders that were provided at that point. Because if, if you actually look at what the UN attempted to set up, the borders were almost, I mean, they were just ridiculous. They, they were absurd. They were, they were based largely off of population centers, but they weren't defensible at all. They, they for were, neither side. For neither side. Yeah. It just didn't, it didn't make a, a lot of sense based off of what they were trying to do. But it was, again, as Christian pointed out, a very complex issue. The, the 1948 war, which lasted, I think, just over nine months, um, ended in an Israeli victory. Not a total Israeli victory, though, because the Jordanians, you could actually argue, won on their front. They managed to take the West Bank. And Israel managed to take everything else minus the Gaza Strip, which fell under the control of Egypt. Yeah. And that was the state of affairs until another war broke out, the Six Day War. Yeah. And then, well, the next major war, there's been all kinds of, of smaller conflicts and whatnot. But the next major war was the Six Day War in 1967. This is where um, uh, the, the Egyptians had, had set up a, a fairly close alliance with uh, Syria. In fact, at one point, Syria and Egypt were considered technically one country. And um, United Arab Republic. Yeah. And, and you had most of the Arab nations in the world closely aligning themselves with the Soviets and Israel was closely allied with the United States. And so what you had is Israel had very good intelligence that Egypt kept essentially suggesting that they were going to launch an attack on, on Israel at any time any day. And Israel was looking at this from the perspective of, okay, if we get simultaneous attacks from Jordan, Syria, and Egypt, it, it's going to be incredibly difficult, if not nearly impossible to be able to defend against that unless we attain air superiority. So Israel launched a surprise attack against Egypt and um, they essentially wiped out the Egyptian and Syrian air forces almost instantaneously. I mean, it was very, very quick. And then at that point they were I mean, the, the Egyptian, Syrian, and, and Jordanian ground forces were just decimated. Israel won on all fronts. They took the Golan yeah. Heights. They took the West Bank. They took Gaza. They took the Sinai Peninsula. Yeah, they took the Sinai Peninsula. I and mean, that held was, until the 1973, 1973 war. war. So in 1973, Sadat launched Sadat. Who was, so was Nasser was the, the head of Egypt at that point. Um, Sadat takes over as the head of Egypt. They launched the surprise attack in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. Yom Kippur is the highest holy day in, in uh, Israeli history. And at this point, this got so bad that Moish Dayan, who was the Secretary of Defense at that time, he's kind of he iconic. He had like an eye patch. He had lost an eye fighting. Um, and um, he had actually... Re- he had actually recommended to Golda Meir, who was the um, the Labor Party uh, prime minister at the time, that they might actually have to consider um, a, a negotiated surrender. They, they didn't think they had the capacity because catching them by surprise, not to mention the fact that the Russians had loaded down the Egyptians and Syrians with very, very high quality surface to air missiles, which helped mitigate some of Israel's uh, air superiority. And then on top of that, they'd also get them, I think it was called A7 Sagar anti-tank missiles. They were wire guided anti-tank missiles, which had actually given the, um, uh, the Egyptians a, a, an advantage in uh, the Sinai Peninsula when they were first making their, their initial offensive. What ended up happening was the United States ended up replenishing uh, Israeli supplies. Uh, and again, people like, oh, well, you know, they, they tipped the scale. Okay, well, the Soviets were tipping the scale in, in favor of the Syrians the, and the Egyptians. So let's not pretend like nobody else was involved here. But uh, essentially, the, um, 
the Israelis were not only able to stem the tide of the offensive, they actually turned the tide. And in fact, at one point, um, Israeli paratroopers actually landed on Egyptian soil. They actually crossed the Suez Canal onto Egyptian soil. They had surrounded an Egyptian division, and then you had a ceasefire. And what happened under that ceasefire is Sadat agreed um, to recognize Israel in exchange for a return of the Sinai Peninsula. And when what was done there, this this was kind of interesting because it was seen it was seen almost as if uh, the Egyptians had regained some of their honor, even though it didn't work out well. Their initial offensive against the Israelis had had done well. They got a bunch of territory back uh, that they considered historically within their their realm of influence and and power. And then Israel got recognition by Egypt, which, which was huge. It's also safe to say that the other thing that actually came with this is the two. Typically speaking, year over year, the two largest recipients of U.S. foreign aid are Israel and Egypt. And there's a reason for that. It's because if Egypt's not going to war with Israel, there's really no other Arab country in the world that can launch any sort of all-out meaningful existential threat to Israel. And so that that foreign aid and kind of keeping the various regimes in place, with, or, or I shouldn't say keeping in place, um, but assistance to that actually helped maintain some peace. So that was... That was last, the last major, like what you might call existential threat. But what's happened since then is with the talk of, you know, the Palestinian state with various attacks coming out of Lebanon. Iran has been a major player in supporting terrorist groups, attacking Israel. This has been something that the Israeli people have constantly lived under. You've it's seen this Israel, surprise attacks all of the time. You, you've seen Israel have to, it, it, their adversaries have shifted from nation states like Egypt, Syria, Jordan to, to non-nation state actors, right? Non-state actors. Yeah. And, and th this is where you get to the present day, right? This is where you get to Hamas because the, the, the Palestinians after three major military defeats in a row, the PLA, um, uh, has moderated a lot of their language over the last yeah. 20, 30 years or so. Yeah. And, you 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 saw certain elements of the Palestinian movement renounce violence as a means to achieve their political ends, which is the establishment of a Palestinian state. But the problem is, is that not the entire Palestinian movement has done so. And so in the 80s, you saw the emergence of a movement called Hamas that was a splinter group within the Palestinian movement that did not renounce violence. In fact, openly advocated for it. If you read the Hamas's charter, it literally talks about how, like, you know, we want literally like we want to commit genocide against Jewish people. That is almost verbatim what it says in the Hamas charter. And what you saw was, is that as as uh the more mainstream factions within the Palestinian movement moderated their language. Hamas got more radical over time until eventually you, you saw a split. And so the two Palestinian territories, parts of the West Bank and Gaza, you saw the more moderate faction take control of the West Bank. And in Gaza, you saw Hamas take over. And this was this century. This was in the last 20 years. You saw a um, contested election in, in Gaza in like 2005, 2006, um, Hamas won. There was actually a very brief civil war within the Palestinian movement for control of Gaza. Hamas won that civil war and expelled the other Palestinian, the, the more moderate factions of yep. the Palestinian movement. And so Hamas has governed Gaza basically as their own private territory since 2006. This also co um, uh, um, this also aligns with when Israel decided to disengage from Gaza. They used to occupy Gaza. They yeah. had done so since they took it from the Egyptians. And they pulled out of Gaza in 2006. And a lot of Israelis are probably now thinking that that's a mistake. But that brings us to, I think that basically brings us to the present day. I think we've talked about the the vast majority of the history, 3,000 yeah. years, for the people who think that, oh, this only started in 1948 or 1967 yeah. or whatever. No, this has been going on for a long, long time. Yeah, and, it, and it's, important under, it's important to understand that, that component of it. Um, now, I, look, I know typically this is the part of the show where I do some sort of quirky segue into our Good Ranchers ad out of respect for the situation. I'm not going to do you know, anything like that, but um, I do want to let everyone know that once again, Good Ranchers is a, a huge sponsor of the show. We really appreciate all the support that they give to us. We want to highly encourage all of you to also support them if you're looking for a quality place to buy American-raised beef, pork, poultry, and now even wild-caught seafood. If you use promo code NICK, you're still going to be able to get some deals uh, available to you with respect to shipping, with respect to the very subscriptions that they have. Uh, one of the things that's great about this, this uh 
uh, program is that, or the great about what Good Ranchers does is that you can sign in, you can sign on for a subscription, you can turn it on, you can turn it off, you can set your parameters that you want for it, and you can get locked into a price. And that is a, an incredible deal when you consider everything that's been going on with inflation and whatnot. But they do an excellent job. They produce an excellent product. Remember, one of our commitments to you is we're not going to recommend that you buy or try something simply because they support us or simply because they claim to be patriotic. They got to provide a good quality product. If you want to, if you want to wave the flag over your product, then you better be producing something good. And Good Ranchers does exactly that. And we are very, very thrilled to be able to team with them. And we thank them so much for the support that they give us and highly encourage you. Go on there, promo code Nick. Go ahead and check out. Check out some of the wild caught seafood. That's that's a new thing uh, that they've been doing. And again, they just produce an excellent product. So once again, thank you very much to Good Ranchers. Okay, so why did we go through all of this? Well, part of it is because we want people to understand that um, a, a lot of the arguments that you're going to be seeing and some of the tweets that we're going to be showing you later on how the left has responded to this have been focused on this idea of colonization, decolonization, an apartheid state. Um, and, and it's this idea that, that Israel are just the, is just the bad guys in here in every possible way. And, and it doesn't seem to match up with respect to the way that the left or certain elements within the left talk about other things or talk about other in instances. And there's going to be some people that say like, oh, okay, so you're making an argument for why the, the Jews should be in this part of the world. Well, then I guess if the Cherokee or the Comanche or the, what I'm, what I'm saying is this, colonization has been a thing that every single culture has engaged in, in all parts of the world. This idea that colonization is something that was invented by the West or invented by our little satellite states or something like that. I'm sorry, that's just factually incorrect. It is factually incorrect. You can, you can look at the history of, of um, the world, and what you're going to find is various ethnic groups, various uh, tribal groups, constantly moving and shifting and going into different places and, and settling down and essentially bringing in their culture with them. Right? This has been a common thing throughout history. So what I find confusing is, is not so much this idea that um, th there would be Arab populations that don't want the Jewish state to exist. I disagree with them, but I'm not totally, uh, I, I'm not unaware of their position on this. I also understand why the Jewish state wants to exist. I also understand why they want to exist in an area which is considered their traditional and ancestral homeland. Like this all makes sense to me. And, and we can certainly look back at, at history and try to be intellectually honest and consistent with the fact that, yes, people have moved around. And, and that doesn't mean that everyone just gets to you know, move up and shove everybody out that's there now because of who was there before. By the same token, when you see kind of a unique struggle that's taking place within this part of the world right now, I think it's disingenuous for the same people on the left who, uh, again, if, if, you, if you get anything wrong with their pronouns, consider it to be an act of violence, but will then celebrate when a terrorist organization is moving in and kidnapping people to use them as human shields. That's where we get to the heart of today's episode. And that's where we're going to get into this next part on why does there, and, and, and I, I want to emphasize something here because some of the, some of the most interesting fights we've been seeing right now on social media, on Twitter is the left versus the left or what we would probably describe as more of your traditional liberals versus your hardcore leftists. And so Christian went through, found a bunch of examples of this that we're going to, we're going to talk about right now. So, um, Christian, go ahead and, uh, yeah, Hamilton, if you scroll up, we, we've got a lot of links that I've pulled from Twitter and, and I mean, so many to, to really get across what's going on. We're, we're going to just briefly go through some of these, some of these faster than others, because I'm sure that you've seen a lot of these. This first one is um, one of the DSA rallies that took place in New York City. DSA is Democratic Socialists of America. Um, yep. And I mean, it, 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 Hamilton, if you want to play the audio for a second, if you can, you don't need to play the whole thing, of course. We'll, we'll play the rest of it on mute. Um, you don't need to start from the beginning, by the way. Um, because it's like two, it's almost three minutes long. And again, we're not going to play the entire thing. But I mean, here's one of them. And there's a direct quote from the audio. And if we don't get to it in the podcast, you can go on Twitter and listen to it for yourself. But, you know, somebody was talking about how these resistance fighters came in and electrified hanging gliders and took at least several dozen hipsters out. And then everybody's cheering and, and clapping and excited about the fact that Hamas terrorists, and that is what they are. And I don't care if people disagree. They're more than welcome to. But Hamas terrorists murdering, butchering innocent people that have nothing to do with the 
the hundred plus year long debate between Israel and Palestine, right? The, the, these are people that are at a concert and they're getting slaughtered by the hundreds. It was almost 300 of them were murdered. And that's not counting how many women were raped, by the way. These are the same people that talk about that. These are the same people that, that lecture us and more or less about rape culture on campus and toxic masculinity. And at the same token, they're celebrating war crimes. But here's the thing. You might look at this and think, oh, this is, the, you know, this is unique. This is a one-off thing. It's actually not. We have a lot of these clips to go through. So we'll go to the next one. Here's the next one. There's only one solution. Antifada, Antifada revolution. Antifada re references the, the, the ongoing war, the constant on and off warfare between the Palestinians and the Israelis. This is now considered like the third Antifada. There was, there was two previously before. And uh, one of which that, that ended in the 2006 disengagement from Gaza. And again, hundreds of, of pro-Hamas, I'm not even going to call them pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas protesters from a DSA rally in the heart of New York City. Well, and, and, it's in, and it's interesting that, again, it's, it's, Democrat, it's Democratic Socialists of America. We're, we're not talking about... We're not talking about um, Palestinians living in New York that are, are, are rallying that, that may agree with what Hamas is doing or may, um, you know, not approve of the Israeli state. It's Democratic Socialists of America. Like it, it is an organization which is essentially rooted in, in leftist ideology, not necessarily um, a, a very specific or ethnic dog in the fight in this particular or religious dog in the fight with respect to this conflict. And, and yet they they automatically associate with an organization like Hamas and and just to give you an idea i want to i want to read off just a couple of things in in the Hamas charter they have what's called the call to jihad. And it says the day the enemies usurp part of Muslim land, jihad becomes the individual duty of every Muslim in the face of the Jews usurpation. It is compulsory that the banner of jihad be raised. And then it says anti-Semitic incitement. <clears throat> the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees and the rocks and trees will cry out. Oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. That's article seven of, of the charter. Um, <clears throat> and then, you also see the Hamas regards itself as spearhead in the vanguard of the circle of str struggle against world Zionism. Islamic groups all over the world, Arab world, should also do the same since they are best equipped for their future role in the fight against the warmongering Jews. This is Article 32 of, of the Charter uh, of Hamas. So, again, let's be real clear about the organization that's launching this attack, what their philosophy is, what they mean. It, it's not as if they're couching all of this in, in language that can't be clearly understood. I mean, this is what they stand for, and yet, right? And and so I, I just find that's interesting. Let's look at the next one. Hamilton, is it possible for you to play the audio of any of these for our audio listeners? I, that's the reason I'm asking because I, I, I'm 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 trying to get across to the people that don't watch the show but listen to the show exactly what's going on. Sure, it doesn't need play. to be this one, but it, it it's certainly the the last one. Here's another one. This is actually a back and forth argument between pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian protesters. By the way, this is not just taking place in the United States. This is taking place in Canada. This is taking place in the UK. This is taking place in Australia. It's taking place in Germany and France, across the entire Western world, basically. So, Hamilton, if you pause this one, there's one more that I want to show, and this one is probably the most despicable of them. And that was in a suburb of Seattle, by yeah. the way. No, 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 no. It, you, you skipped next one. No, no, other way, <laughs> other way, Hamilton. You, one you more to the skipping. left. One more to the left. You keep skipping. You're, <laughs> one more Hamilton to the left. The, there, yes, you go. there, there you go. There you go. We yeah. got You're going to need to go. Want to go back to the beginning and All then right. play the audio on this. This is in front of the Sydney Opera House. So there's a lot of screaming, gas the Jews, F the Jews. This is a, this is a pro, um, pro Palestinian or pro Hamas rally going on in Sydney outside of the, uh, opera house. Yep. Um, go ahead and click on the next, um, next link. And that just does it right there. Yeah. There's, this is actually somebody at the, uh, now I, again, I, I think this has actually been ver verified, um, but she's holding up actually a Nazi uh, flag That's actually on her a, phone. They, they misidentified that it. He? That, that was actually a he, a he that was, yeah. the, the way that it was it was shown, it made it look like that it was one of the women that was holding it up. But yeah, yeah the, it, for our audio listeners, this is the DSA rally in New York City again. Mm -hmm. Somebody holding up literally a Nazi swastika. And 
the reason that we bring this up is because there's been some elements of the left, the liberals, not the yeah. left, not leftists. There's been some elements of, of liberals, um, you know, central left type people, the type of people that would disagree with Nick and I on the top marginal tax rate. Yeah. Um, who have seen the rhetoric, the cheering, all of this going on and have started to come to some in incredible conclusions about just what people actually believe. And part of this is because as one person pointed out this, um, one guy on, on Twitter, um, uh, he, he has the Twitter handle, no opinion. Um, he, he pointed out that, you know, the, the, the left like leftists have chosen some really interesting allies in this lately. Yeah. And speaking of that, a lot of them are in American academia. We yeah. have talked about this in the podcast before the ideological capture of most of our institutions in this country. And here's just a few samples of examples of academics, professors at taxpayer funded and also private institutions, you know, universities across the country that aren't just okay with what happened, but are actually openly celebrating the massacre of a thousand women, men, children, foreigners, not not occupiers, not not Zionists, innocent people. The the systematic butchering of those people in the span of seventy two hours, celebrating that under the guise of decolonization. So here's one example for you right here. Emil J. Joseph, PhD. And of course, he has he, him uh, pronouns in his bio right there. Here's what he says. Post-colonial, anti-colonial, and decolonial are not just words you heard in an EDI workshop. That stands for equality, diversity, and inclusion. E e equity. Yeah. Well, Di it can be either, but yeah. 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 No, it, it's, it, it's it, and again, <laughs> so somebody RGC just said, question, how come nobody mentions the innocent Palestinian people who Israel is about to obliterate? I, I, I don't know. I don't know how more, you know, here, here's the part RGC. I don't know you. I don't know if you watch the channel. So I, I'm going to assume you mean this is a genuine question because I've seen other people ask it where it was entirely intellectually dishonest. So I'm going to totally give you the benefit of the doubt. People do mention it. We mention it. I don't want innocent Palestinians to die. I don't want anyone to die. I also think it's very, very important to distinguish and we, we mentioned this in the beginning, whenever you're talking about armed conflict, and I know because I've been in it, whenever you're talking about armed conflict, you have fog of war. You have, uh, and, I, and I don't use this term loosely as, as if to be dismissive, but they call collateral damage. And what that means is damage that was not intended. When you have somebody that attacks you and then you respond and then before you respond, you tell everyone, hey, we're going to respond. Don't be around military targets. If you can leave, leave. If you can get to a safe position, get to a safe position. And then you attack the area that you said you were going to attack. You have done everything you can possibly do to attempt to prevent civilian casualties and collateral damage. But if the only if the only standard you're willing to accept is, no, 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 if anybody innocent gets killed, then they're war criminals and they're bad and they're evil, then what you've done is you've accepted a paradigm where Hamas gets to go in, butcher and murder and kill people indiscriminately or sometimes deliberately targeting innocent people because they believe it will have the highest impact, political impact. And then when anybody responds, if it's anything less than pristine and perfect, it is unacceptable. And so what you are doing, you're, you, you are creating an impossible paradigm in which you actually elevate terrorist attacks. Because what you're saying is, is that, well, if they engage in terrorist attacks, well, you know, hey, look, that's just something that they, they had to do because they're at such a major disadvantage militarily or technologi technologically. But if you respond in any way where someone gets cut, even if you take every single reasonable measure you can imagine, then what you're saying is, is nope, Israel just has to sit there and get trashed, get burned, get butchered, get murdered. They just have to sit there and take it. They're not allowed to respond. Like I, I don't, again, I don't want this war to be going on. I don't want either side to be losing people. I don't want innocent people to die. I, I would love a scenario where it is where, where Hamas just wants to launch strategic military uh, attacks against military targets and Israel gets to respond against those military targets. But Hamas doesn't like to do that. Hamas likes to go in, kidnap people and then use them as human shields. So once again, we, we, in case anybody is wondering, 
We don't want any innocent people to die. We don't want anybody to die. We especially don't want innocent people to die, regardless of what side they might be on the conflict. All right, but you know, Hamas, Hamas has an, an excellent opportunity right now. They have an excellent opportunity right now to demonstrate that they also don't want the loss of innocent human life. They could actually facilitate and, and request that countries like Egypt or other Arab countries in the world take on non-combatants and civilians so they can fight. So they can fight in a realm where they don't have to worry about that collateral damage. You think Hamas is going to do that? Hamas will do the opposite. Hamas, because Hamas wants to take the camera there and say, oh my gosh, look at how horrible this was. At the so, same so time. No, so, so no, I'm, look, I'm, I'm, I, I'm done with this idea of talking about this as if this is all just happening in a vacuum. It isn't. So again, I'm going to assume your question was genuine. That's my genuine response to it. I don't want any innocent people to die. Don't want any innocent people to die. However, I also understand that if you go out and you attack somebody and they come back and attack you, you don't get to load up innocent civilians where you know they're going to attack and then feign like you cared about the innocent civilians. You don't get to do that. This is happening at the same time that Hamas has publicly threatened to execute hostages on live television and broadcast it on the internet. So for anybody to try to make some sort of moral equivalency between the actions of Israel and the actions of Hamas, I would ask this question. Who would you rather be captured by? Yeah. Yep. And I say this as somebody who, by the way, has publicly come out before and said, I don't think we should. I, and and th this is a contra very controversial position to take on the right, especially with within American politics. I've come out in the past and said that I don't think we should give Israel foreign aid or military aid. I don't think that the United States should be giving anybody, anybody foreign aid or military aid. And I understand that there's a lot of people, a lot of people that disagree with me on that. And that's totally okay. But I hold that position mostly because I, I actually do genuinely care more about, you know, the situation that like we have on the Southern border than I do about foreign borders, a thousand, 3000 miles away from the United States. But I can hold that position on one hand. And on the other hand, also call out evil for evil. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but butchering innocent people and then executing hostages and broadcasting it on the internet and then bragging about it and slapping DEI labels like decolonization in front of it and patting yourselves on the back for being the good guys. No, that's evil. And by the way, here's another tweet from another professor who says, Jario Funes Flores says, decolonization is about dreaming and fighting for a present and future free of occupied indigenous territories. It's about a free Palestine. It's about liberation and self-determination. It's about living with dignity. Decolonization is not a metaphor. No, apparently decolonization equals genocide. So you're right. It's not a metaphor. I actually replied to this guy and said the last 24 hours have shown us that decolonization is actually about the mass murder and rape of women and children by people who use whatever slogans and buzzwords they want to provide moral justification for their atrocities. This is an academic. This is a professor in Texas tweeting this. By the way, he's not alone. We've got all the receipts that you could possibly ask for pulled up here. Here's another tweet. Look at this one. 100,000 likes from a Somali living in Minnesota saying, what do y'all think decolonization meant? Vibes, papers, essays, losers. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is interesting. We were pointing this out before. So, okay, so a Somali in Minnesota is talking about decolonization. Again, the United States is is a country where we actually largely welcome immigrants into the country, but I, I do think it's interesting that he doesn't see any potential irony in, in his own statement there, especially when you look at what he's willing to justify in the name of, quote, decolonization. She, but or she, what she's willing to, to ju uh, justify in the name of decolonization. But but the, the reason why we went through the whole history of the Levant was to be able to demonstrate that if you had some sort of notion in your mind that Jews across the world one day just randomly decided, gosh, this part of the Mediterranean Sea is really nice this time of year. I think we'll we'll take over this place without having any sort of ancestral background to it. That, that, that doesn't make sense. And, and for everybody that is then coming back and saying, oh, well, what about this? What? No, you're the one making this argument. I'm just pointing out that it doesn't seem to bear any sort of intellectual consistency or honesty with, with everything else that you say. But again, when we're going to get to this, maybe intellectual consistency and honesty is not the point. All right, let's go ahead and look at the next uh, tweet. 
A group of Harvard students, for our audio listeners, a group of Harvard students released a statement that begins, we, the Understein student organizations, hold the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. The statement continues, but that's all you need to know. <laughs> Israelis, young and old, were slaughtered in their homes. Entire families were butchered in cold blood. In one home, a terrorist shot the parents dead, took a child's cell phone, and live streamed the horrors on the child's Facebook account. Elsewhere, dozens of young people were massacred at a music festival. Grandmothers were snatched from their homes and taken hostage. They took mothers carrying babies. Hamas is currently holding over 100 hostages, most of whom are civilians. Some are babies and children. But again, but again, here, here's the, uh, here's the, the list of, uh, what is it? This is the list of organizations. There was 31 Harvard 31. organizations. There's the Hamilton. The next tweet goes into more detail about, um, uh, about this. If you click on the next link that we have at the top, and I know that it's hard for Hamilton okay, to do go. this because of the light in his eyes. <laughs> so yeah. here's another one. 31, yes, 31 Harvard organizations have declared that the murderers, rapes, kidnappings, and other atrocities committed by Hamas against innocent people are in no way the fault of Hamas, but are rather entirely the fault of Israel. Something is deeply, deeply wrong in academia. Yeah, and it has been for a while. Let's look at the next one. Here's where it gets really funny. So, okay, here's here's what's interesting. So Don, Don Q says, and we can actually, I think we can click on this one. Don, Settlers aren't civilians. When you steal the land of others and deny them basic human rights, you don't really get to be a civilian. So if you, if you carry this out to its logical conclusion, what he's saying is that none of the Jews living in the Levant are innocent because essentially they're all colonizers, settlers, etc. Somebody brings this up in, in a now, response. Yeah, so here's what's interesting. Another person, presumably also left wing Hamilton you got to go back presumably left wing also says basically like okay wait a second does this mean that me as a non native american doesn't deserve human rights and could be gunned down at any moment and here's the response they get go ahead and switch over to the other one hamilton uh so hale with a hammer and sickle in her thing says yes uh john de leon technically yes kraz yeah i mean the, the number of people that are now Jumping on here and saying, "Yeah, you you can be gunned down if you're if you're a non-native American and living in the United States, and you get gunned down, you essentially have it coming." And it keeps going. And while it's fun to laugh at insane people on Twitter, it's actually really disturbing how popular this self-destructive, nihilistic death cult yeah. apparently is on certain elements of the left. Another Twitter account. TB, uh, TBH, yeah. yeah, and I also do as a non-Native American. Next one, Boo, Boo Gray, yes, Hindi with a uh, Palestinian flag in there, correct. Next one. Um, you don't Osa, need to read the title. Osa KU PhD, yes, right? So once again, you gotta, gotta love higher education. Yes, you deserve to have a rocket hit your house, settler. Another um, one, yes. Yes, so it, it's, again, it, it's just interesting to interesting to watch that th this idea that if you fall into this category, it's not simply that they disagree with you. It's not simply they think you're wrong. It's not simply that they think that there is, you know, maybe some sort of political recourse that needs to be taken in the form of maybe reparations or whatever else it is. No, if you get hit with a rocket, if you get killed, you have it coming because you are an oppressor. There was and some, human rights don't apply to them there because was, they've decided you're an oppressor. There was somebody that brought up, and I did not, uh, save the link for this, unfortunately. But there was somebody that brought up, you cannot claim that decolonization equals mass murder and genocide of your ideological opponents and then be surprised when nobody wants to hop on board with decolonization. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a great way to turn a lot of people into being pro-colonization. If, if decolonization equals slaughtering innocent people. Yeah. And so some of the disturbing responses that you're seeing. And by the way, this is almost entirely grassroots. This is almost all yeah. from the bottom up. There's very few elected officials within the Democratic Party that are coming out saying, not, not even AOC and Ilhan Omar came out and said, yeah, Hamas are the good guys here. Not even they came out. Now, they came out with extremely, extremely well, Rashida, weak Rashida statements. Rashida Tlaib has a, yeah, Palestinian. Yeah, they came out with yeah. extremely weak statements, right? But, but there's virtually no elected official that came out and said, yeah, I support Hamas. A lot of them came out with or a lot of weak need statements, but what you're seeing is is an upswelling of this pro genocidal position from the grassroots, and so you see other people that are on the left, but they're more liberals rather than leftists, and they're looking at what their comrades are saying, people that are even further to the left than they are, and and they're looking on in horror at what is going on. Yeah, 
And so here's an example from a another professor, somebody with a PhD, who says, I'm seeing many of the same people who think that speech is violence and that people will be harmed by hearing milk toast center-left opinions like mine because they're not in lockstep with the woke orthodoxy, minimizing and condoning kidnapping, gang rape, and murder. And, and it's important to understand that the person that's making this, again, PhD, and considers herself left of center. She's a center leftist. And, and again, she's absolutely right. She walks into a college campus and, and makes, again, the most, any sort of statement that would have been considered perfectly rational and reasonable 10 years ago. And now all of a sudden you're perpetrating violence against trans communities or whatever it is. Right. But now all of a sudden when it's, when it's Hamas and Israel, Kidnapping, gang rape, and murder is all fine. It's just part of decolonization. And this is the part where, again, a, a liberal, a, a left of center liberal is starting to recognize, wait a second, there's, there's something seriously flawed in this sort of reasoning and seriously intellectually inconsistent. Let's look at the next one. Uh, so Farah, she says, this tweet demonstrates something I've become aware of in the last five years. And this is important because this is the red pilling that is continually going on. When you look at people like Jordan Peterson, who used to be a socialist, when you look at people like Elon Musk, who you know had always voted for Democrats, when you look at people like Joe Rogan, all these guys used to consistently across the board, vote Democrat, all these other steps. She goes, this tweet demonstrates something I've become aware of in the last five years. Do we years. want to show them what that, the tweet was that she's quoting? No, not just yet. I, I want <laughs> right. to read it. That all those marginalized people that I, as a silly, bleeding heart lefty, cared so much for are no different to those they claim were in the wrong. The colonists, the racists, the sexists, blah, blah, blah. As soon as people get the chance, they'll power grab and walk all over others, complete with the same violence, racism, etc. It's not about righting wrongs. Well, Najama, in answer, I really did think I was about, <clears throat> I, it was about making the world better, raising people up and finding peace together. But don't worry, my eyes are now open. She was in response. She was writing in response to that that Somali in Minnesota yeah. that, that we quoted earlier her what name do you was, think? was and, Najama and 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 they're showing it they're showing a picture this is on the the in wokeness uh, twitter channel this is what decolonization means and it won't stop with Israel and again it's them it's them taking a a woman and i mean she's clearly been messed up pretty bad and, and loading her onto a truck um but i scroll up again i i want to read this off again um this is the part that i think is so so interesting here that all those marginalized people that I, as a silly, bleeding heart lefty, cared so much for are no different to those they claim were in the wrong, the colonists, the racists, the sexists. As soon as people get the chance, they'll power grab and walk all over others, complete with the same violence and racism. It's not about righting wrongs. And then again, I, this part, I'm reading again because I think it's so important. Well, uh, Najama, in answer, I really did think it was about making the world better, raising people up and finding peace together. But don't worry, my eyes are open now. And this is the part where I think a lot of people had been so frustrated. I know I had been frustrated because I, I was I was always let me let me put it this way. If you look at the majority of governments that have run Israel, I wouldn't have voted for them. Right? I'm I'm not a Labor Party guy. I, I don't I don't agree with Labor Party politics. But I but I always felt that it it seemed it seemed right or it seemed just that the Jewish people have a homeland, especially given the some of the very unique circumstances of how they'd been targeted all over the world and specifically during World War II. And it seemed to make sense that they would have a homeland and, and for which they had a, an, an ancestral um, connection to. And it seemed that it made sense, especially since there was a, a, a large Jewish population already there. And it seemed to make sense because that whole area, it's not like... It's not like Palestine had been its own independent sovereign nation. It hadn't been. It had been a province of multiple empires of different ethnicities over time. And now all of a sudden we're pretending like, no, 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 it's only been this. And, and, it's, and it's hard for me to reconcile because, again, it was the Democratic Party under Harry Truman in 1948 that helped push through the homeland for the Jewish people, helped negotiate that. And, and now, again, you're, you're watching as the left is just pro-Hamas. And this is where liberals, and this is why we make the distinction between liberals and leftists. This is where liberals who are saying, you know what? I, I, may, want a, I may want more government involvement with respect to health care, or I may want a larger marginal tax rate, or I may want um, you know, more funding for social programs. 
and and I may have a problem with the the colonial powers that that you know went into Africa and, and set up colonial regimes, and I'm and I'm glad they're gone, and I'm glad those those countries are are now ruled by the people that originally lived there. But since when did we become pro butchering and murdering innocent people, provided that they fall within this category of colonizer or settler or oppressor? There, there seems to be an intellectual disconnect there. And what they're finding, what the, what the liberals are finding, is that all the things that these hardcore leftists, these DSA-type socialists, used to call the right, used to call conservatives, used to call people like me, when they called us you know, bigots and racists and sexists and imperialists and everything else, liberals used to sit back and be like, well, it's, it's a little hyperbolic, but I, I get where you're coming from. Well, now they're the ones being called that. Why? Well, not because they necessarily agree with everything Israel does, not even because they necessarily agree with an Israeli state even. They may be fine with saying, well, yeah, there needs to be some sort of you know, breakdown or there needs to be some sort of you know, return. No, no, no. If you are not sufficiently supportive of Hamas going in and kidnapping people, then you're now the enemy. And you've got a lot of liberals that have said, wait a second, wait a second. For, for years, for decades, I, I fought for increased civil liberties. I fought for civil rights. I fought for criminal justice reform. I fought for, you know, all of these things that we're talking about. You know, you know more money to the third world. And I, I fought for all of it. And now I'm, I'm, a, I'm a horrible, evil, imperialist Zionist because I don't think Hamas should be kidnapping innocent people in the desert and then using them as human shields. And the answer from the DSAs are yes. Yes, you are. It's even worse than that. It's also, and you should die too. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's not even that, that you should celebrate, you know, this woman who, by the way, I believe was actually murdered. I'm pretty sure. Unfortunately, it's not even that you should celebrate that. It's also, and you should die yeah. too. That's the thing that a lot of these people are, are starting to conclude. Uh, Hamilton, could you go to the next link? Yeah, here's. Here. I love uh, Joel, Joel Paco. Calm down and stop supporting Israel so blindly. How, how many? It, it's almost as if, like, these are the sort of repeated narratives that we get sometimes that, that quite frankly, I find patently absurd. Because I, I've just, I just got done saying that there's things that the Israeli government has done that I don't agree with. That there's a lot of Israeli governments that I personally wouldn't have supported or voted for. I, I have, I have never suggested that Israel has always been in the right. I think Israel has done bad things as well. I think on the whole, though. I'm I'm supportive of the again the Jews having their own state, and and it being in a place that I think is very very historically logical and relevant. But but again, if it's not no 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 you're you're not saying what I want you to say, so you need to blindly stop. Fun. Are you serious? Here's a take from Noah Smith. I I hinted at this earlier. This is a guy who's definitely center left. I mean he's got a he's got a Ukraine flag in his bio for crying out loud. Um, but he's an interesting dude. And he started to notice something that was a bit interesting about the, the apparent contradictions in some left-wing, you know, ideological takes. So this one person tweeted, it's weird how Hamas is obviously far right, but only the far left supports them. And then he quote tweeted them and said, the far left dreams of nothing but power. Their ideology is utterly plastic and malleable, a tool to be modified or discarded at will. They are obsessed with power. It's their constant daydream, their entire vision of the world and the very air they breathe. And if you go to um, the last link, Hamilton, um, here's here's a former lib, a famous YouTuber known as Sargon of Akkad. People yeah. who, who actually know him know that he used to be on the left. Um, in his first videos, he was talking about feminism. This was like 10 years ago. And he was he he he, he actually gave an interview with um Dave Rubin, former leftist as well, who used to work with the Young Turks. He gave an interview with him like a, about a week or two ago. And um, Carl Benjamin, who's the actual name behind um, uh, the, the YouTube account, Sargon of Akkad, he pointed out that when he first started diving into politics a little bit, he was genuinely offended when people accused him of being a sexist or a misogynist. He was genuinely offended because he was like, I am a liberal. I believe in, in certain liberal values. Why are you accusing me of these extreme right wing positions? And so he he pushed back thinking that he would get genuine intellectual engagement and that you would eventually you know find a, a place of of you know common sense and common ground and instead he found himself being pushed further and further to the right to the point that now he he identifies as somebody on the right and he tweeted about this 
And Benjamin says that today you were given, he tweeted this the day after this started. So that he tweeted this on October 8th. And he said, today you were given a view into the depths of the beating bloodthirsty heart of the left. You finally got to see the very bottom of the pit of resentment contained within. Applause for the rape of women and the murder of children. It is true that the left lurks beneath um, this is the true left that lurks beneath the polite norms of civil society. This is the left which admits that there's no act so savage that they will not condone it if it brings about, quote unquote, liberation. When a group arises that does have the means, no matter how barbaric, they will vicariously revel in the bloodshed because that's what they want to do to you. Every time they call you an oppressor, that's what they ultimately want your fate to be. Their only regret is that they themselves do not have the fortitude or opportunity to carry out such atrocities. This is what these people really believe and passionately desire, and you are trapped in this civilization with them. Do not forget it. That's crazy coming from him. I mean, I just, I wouldn't expect something that kind of like powerful uh, on something like that coming from him. He never would have said that 10, 15 years ago. No, well, there's, there's been a significant difference. Well, listen, Bass asked the question, uh, wait one second here. Uh, where was it? He said, uh, Nick, can't the changes to the NDAA Act and the use of term of the term terrorist be used against Americans in the same dehumanizing manner? So uh, there, there's a couple. Well, first of all, I, I, I certainly, I mean, I'm not in Congress, but if I had been, I wouldn't have voted for this last National Defense Authorization Act. I think there's been some, some major problems and we've given the executive branch far too much power. I, I think some of the issues that we have with um, like the Patriot Act where it, it, here, let me, let me read some stuff off here. A person engages in domestic terrorism if they do an act dangerous to human life that is a violation of the criminal laws of a state or the United States. If the act appears to be intended to intimidate or coerce the civilian population, influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping. Additionally, the acts have to occur primarily within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. And if they do not may be regarded as international terrorism. Yeah. I, I think, you know, my, my problem with the Patriot act in, in general is that I, I certainly understand why there, there was some, I certainly understand after 9-11 why there was some impulse to try to facilitate greater communication between intelligence agencies. Um, and I think all of us can understand that when you have when you have a massive breakdown and in intelligence failure, the question, the first question that you're asking is, how could this have happened? And then how do we adjust things in order to facilitate greater communication? I think the Patriot Act went too far. I think the Patriot Act went too far. I think the the latest NDAAs have gone way too far. I think when you look at something like this, dangerous to human life, a, a big part of terrorism has has always been associated with the intention. So let me read you. Um, Kind of what the, uh, what is it, the Department of Defense? Let me see if I can bring that one up. Oh, I had it there for a second. I think I lost it. Um, the, I, I think an important distinction is, is what is the motivation and who is the target? So obviously you can have an, an act of violence which is directed at achieving a political outcome. That can be politically motivated violence, right? War is, is politically motivated violence. Um, the, the question is who are you targeting? Or are you deliberately targeting um innocent civilians in order to essentially uh, cause fear in the hopes that it will affect political change or achieve your political objectives. Um, I, I know that's not a perfect, I'm not reading it off anything, but that's when, when we, when we think of terrorism, that's generally what we associate it with. Um, and, and I think that the way that they have tried to expand the definition could be potentially problematic, especially when you have something as, as broad as uh, dangerous to human life. Like it, it's, that's going to be a legal question of what all does that mean? Now, what, what's interesting is that if, if they do want that definition, well, then you're going to have to look at things like Chaz and chop during the summer of love as terrorist attacks because it was absolutely designed, you know, there, there was violence involved. It was absolutely designed to in intimidate civilian populations for the purposes of achieving a political outcome. So does, is that a clear cut case of domestic terrorism? Well, if it is, they sure as hell didn't treat it that way. And so some of this is the, is the arbitrary and for ar the arbitrary enforcement of laws, because once again, when, if, if your objective, if your objective is the consolidation of power and specifically political power, because political power allows you the legal authorization of the use of force, well, then the selective application of laws, it fits right in with your objectives. Because if the only moral outcome is one where you and people who think like you wield power. Well, then as we're seeing right now, you can, you can dismiss a, a whole litany of things that typically would have been considered heinous crimes as a result. Um, and, and 
that's part of the problem that I see with, with again, the potential looseness of the definition with terrorism, because the other thing that happens when something becomes a terrorist act is the, the various agencies or institutions, which are then allowed to respond to that attack. And, and again, in the United States, we've tried to keep a clear line of demarcation between that, which the military deals with and that, which law enforcement deals with. And I have to say, when I look at modern leftism, again, making a distinction between liberalism and leftism. I, I don't think leftists would have any problem whatsoever uh, of using military power in, in order to come after their political enemies. All right, we've got a super chat here from Nico. The fact that we as Americans cannot universally say that the beheading of infants is evil, to me at least, that the U.S. as a nation is bound to separ separate one way or another. Well, thank, thank you for the super chat, Nico. I, I think we, we've talked about this a lot. We've actually had a couple of episodes dedicated specifically to this on, on what causes... What, what causes a nation to split apart or break away or, or devolve into to civil disorder or civil war? And the, one of the big things that we talked about is when people, you, you hear this trope all the time from the left, diversity is our strength, diversity is our strength. Well, no, it depends. Diversity can be a strength. Diversity can also be a, a, a source of, of conflict and violence and murder and separation. Um, the difference is, is that when you have some when you have a, a certain degree of unity of purpose or unity around certain um, culturally shaping institutions where by the rules are, are, are set. And so things like in the United States, this has been defined by things like property rights, um, you know, move, ever, moving more toward, uh, you know, effective political representation through, uh, you know, the vote, um, you know, being able to, uh, and, and part of that property rights, being able to also engage in economic uh, uh, upward mobility through the voluntary transaction of goods and services, right? All, all these things have been unique characteristics about the American experiment, or, or and I don't say unique as in they've never been done anywhere else, but they were they were really at the heart of what was trying to be achieved within the United States, a very, very limited role for government and uh, attempting to maximize individual liberty, even if we haven't always lived up to it. Those were still philosophical premises. Um, when you get to a point where people no longer share um, any sort of uh, unifying component with respect to their past or with respect to their present, and they have diametrically opposed views with respect to where the nation should go, yeah, it's it's hard to imagine a scenario where a country stays together under those conditions. And one of the things that we've talked about in previous episodes is one of the one of the brilliant components of the federalist system was the idea that you and I can both be Americans, but if if you want a, a different approach to government, well, you can live in Massachusetts, and if I want a different approach to government, I can live in Virginia or I can live in Tennessee or whatnot. Uh, essentially, it's not a one size fits all republic because we are at, a, at our heart a republic of republics. But if you have people that don't agree on the past, if you have people that don't agree on where we're going, and if one of those groups believes that they should be able to demand that everyone live essentially the way they want or, or hold the same values or hold the same end states and objectives. And they believe that using federal power is an appropriate way to achieve that. Well, now what's happened is I can't even escape within my own country to a different state that will allow me to live the way I want because now you're using federal power to compel me to do it. If you have all of those, if you have all those things combined, then all it really takes is a hardcore catalyst for you to all, all of a sudden start having serious discussions about separation. And, and I will tell you this much. I don't think, I don't think this element of the left, uh, well, I know this element of the left has not achieved sufficient power to be able to um, do something like that yet. They absolutely want to. And I would say for anybody that thinks, well, this is just, this is just the extreme. <laughs> I, I am sorry, but I, I am watching a major political party in many respects, adopt concepts and ideas and, and views of the world that would have been absurd to that party 15 years ago. And so, no, this extreme element of the left has more power than they have ever possessed before, and especially in culturally shaping institutions like the media and academia. And if, and if you want to know what the country is going to look like in a couple of years, go look to pop culture and go look to academia because they're the ones raising your kids. They're the ones, they're the ones establishing what the HR departments are going to look like and who they're going to be hiring and who they're going to be putting in positions of power and influence in the future. And so we have every right to be concerned about this and liberals who are now starting to realize that simply because these people might have agreed with you on marginal tax policy does not mean you're the same are waking up to this. And it, unfortunately it takes something like Hamas doing what they're currently doing for them to realize that this has become a real problem within their side of the political spectrum. So Nick, 
why is this happening? And I think this is the ultimate question of the podcast. I, I think that we hinted at this in the title and and the thumbnail and stuff like that. What? Why is this happening? And and by this, I don't mean why is this violence going on in the Middle East. We covered that in the in the beginning of the show. But why is the left? And and I, I stress the left. I don't yeah. necessarily mean liberals yeah. here because I do want to give credit where credit is due for some people that are to the left of us on the center left that 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 are with us and in. in condemning literal genocide and atrocities like this. But yeah. why why is is the left embracing, you know, and, and when I say the left, I mean the DEI people, the the decolonization yeah. people, a Democratic lot of the, socialists yes, America. the DSA, a lot of these these people that have infiltrated academia and the media. Why are they embracing Hamas? Why are they embracing the murder and rape of of women and children and live streaming their bodies on the internet and saying that this is something to to not just tolerate but but celebrate and glorify and by the way this is happening in universities all over the country there's a statement that came out from the university of virginia hamilton i sent you the link it's the last link if you want to pull it up i want um or sorry it's not the yeah, it's the last it's the last URL link. I want Nick's take on this because he for a lot of people in the chat that we have a lot of new people listening today, they might not know Nick is a state legislator in Virginia. If you tuned in after the introductions, you might not know this. Nick serves on the education committee in the Virginia House of Delegates. In fact, you're the chair, I believe, of the higher education committee. Yeah. And Hamilton, if you can pull up the link, I just I just messaged you. It's the last URL link out of the the list of them all from Zach Kessel. Um, there's a statement that came out from some of the students at the University of Virginia that is just astonishing right here. So here's what he says. This might be the worst I've seen so far. This guy, I actually had a huge list that I sent Hamilton, but we're only going to show this one unless you want to see the others. He's been compiling statements from universities and students and organizations all over the country all of the United States. And, and he says, this might be the worst one I've seen so far. Students for Justice in Palestine at UVA says Hamas's brutality makes them, quote, hopeful for the future of Palestine. The indiscriminate murder of Jews is, quote, a step towards a free Palestine, they say. This came out yesterday. This well, and let's let's look at their students for justice for Palestine at UVA statement on current situation in Gaza, Palestine, October 8th, 2023. Over the past two days, many of us have been afraid, worried and even hopeful for the future of Palestine. Students for justice in Palestine at UVA unequivocally supports Palestinian liberation and the right of colonized people everywhere to resist the occupation of their land by whatever means they deem necessary. We mourn the loss of human life and hope for long-lasting peace, which cannot be achieved without the firm establishment of equality and justice and an unprecedented feat for the 21st century. Resistance fighters in Gaza broke through the illegitimate border fence, took occupation soldiers hostage, and seized control of several uh, to all settlements that are illegal under international law. I won't read the rest of it. I mean, that's the part where you see, <laughs> by all... <laughs> By any means, they deem necessary. That is, uh, that is that is approval of what they just said. Whatever means necessary, I would never say that. Um, whatever means necessary, okay. Well, they've decided that whatever means necessary are again the the rape, the capture, the killing, the murdering of innocent people. But of course, again, for these guys, they're not innocent. That's the important part to understand. They're not innocent. We we've we've talked about this before. When somebody says that you disagreeing with them about a particular policy position is tantamount to you committing an act of violence. Now, when some people say that, they, they might just be trying to intimidate you into silence. But you need to understand that there are some people that are accusing your speech as violence or they're defining your speech as violence, not because they're trying to shut you up, but because they want to hurt you. And if you disagreeing with them constitutes an aggressive act of violence, well, then their violence directed toward you is merely defensive in nature. And what we're seeing from student groups like this is that it's not just about a proportional response. So it's, it's no longer, I consider your speech violence, and so I'm going to punch you in the face to stop you from talking. Apparently, it's whatever means necessary under the right conditions. And, and this, is, this is University of Virginia, right? This is UVA Charlottesville. UVA Charlottesville. By the way, I had a student group cancel on me to come and speak because they were worried because we, we put out a Facebook post that I had been invited to come and speak there. We, they were worried about what the potential student response would be. 
right? These are, these are our, our academic institutions of higher education, which truly value all points of view. Well, okay, yeah, they, they certainly value this particular point of view, but this is just... So the question is, well, I, I, how did I'll we get this, to this point? It will be an interesting conversation. I will have a very interesting conversation with, with the representatives of UVA during this next legislative session when inevitably they're wanting more taxpayer dollars from the budget. And again, I don't believe in, look, you want to express your opinion, by all means, go express your opinion. This is not necessarily the, the opinion of UVA, right? But I do find it interesting that in so many of our institutions of higher education, when people want to put this out, it's all about freedom of speech. But when a conservative comes to campus, oh, well, that's that's a different story because that's a potential threat. And, and where are these students learning this? Where are these students learning that, you know, it, it's perfectly fine to justify these sort of, of atrocities and legitimate war crimes, perfectly okay to justify it if you're doing it in the name of decolonization? This gets into the contradiction. I, um, because I, I, a lot of people have started to notice that there's a contradiction. You and I had a conversation about this last night, actually. It was a really interesting conversation. I think we, you and I talked for like three hours last night about yeah. this. And I, I kind of had a theory. I ended up writing something. Um, I posted it on Twitter and Facebook. And I, I, I'd like your take on this. Um, Hamilton, feel free to chime in, too, if you, if you want. Um, I know that Hamilton's doing a good job managing <laughs> the stream and, and all the links and everything. But... Um, Nick, I'd love, your, I'd love your take on this. I said, a lot of people don't seem to understand how the far left can embrace both Hamas and transgender ideology. How can they, on one hand, claim that failure to use the correct pronouns is, quote unquote, literally genocide, and on the other hand, claim that actual genocide is simply an act of decolonization to be publicly celebrated? How can they endorse the Nazi ideology of blood and soil when it comes to claims of stolen or occupied land? Because let's be honest, that is what they're embracing. You didn't need to pull up my my Twitter account, but feel free to do so. Um, so then it, it keeps going. You know, how do they endorse the Nazi ideology of blood and soil when it comes to claims of stolen or occupied land while simultaneously arguing for open borders and declaring that no migrant is illegal? No immigrant is illegal. <laughs> These things don't seem to make sense. They appear to be mutually contradictory. But that's the thing. The ability to hold mutually contradictory positions on a variety of issues enables them to assemble a larger coalition to obtain political power. And I go on to say that um, above all else, leftism is a political project geared towards the acquisition and consolidation of power. If power is your end goal above all else, and you talked about this earlier, Nick, holding mutually contradictory views isn't a liability. That's the thing a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. They don't understand how how can the left you know, support queers for Palestine, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, holding mutually contradictory views, it's, it's not a liability. It's actually an asset. Diversity is our strength after all. It's a different type of diversity, not necessarily one that most people think of. But, but it's a diversity of holding mutually contradictory views in order to assemble a larger coalition. And, th and then I keep going on and I say, this is why we've seen the left discard class as their chief political appeal, because they realized that wasn't getting the job done. And the job is obtaining power. In its place, we have instead resort or they've instead resorted to appealing to an endless clown car parade of deranged lunatics. They've built a coalition of the most laughable elements of society. The worse off a group or person acts or performs in the real world, the more praise the left lavishes upon them. And the reason for this is because the people who would never hold power, wealth, or respect in any saints, and, and the reason is because these people would never hold power, wealth, or respect in any sane society. Meritocracies have no use for them. They have nowhere else to go. And so the left leverages the low status of everyone from literal Hamas supporters to the bisexual barista studying queer theory at Berkeley by offering them a degree of power they would never enjoy in a truly meritocratic system in exchange for their loyalty. In doing so, they've built a coalition of losers and lunatics with a vanguard of self-righteous elites to lead them. This is how we've ended up with queers for Palestine without a single person on the left batting an eye. It's a literal cacistocracy, and it's getting worse with each passing year. So what's your take on that? Am I right or wrong? You can disagree as much as you want. <laughs> I, I think so. I think that once upon a time, um, 
if we if we look at leftism from the lens of of Marx and critical theory, which I think is is the is the predominant motivating theme um, within leftism, um, I, I think I think a lot of that is is accurate. I, I think what they did was they started off with um, marginalized groups that were legitimately marginalized. Um, if you were a woman in the United States in the in the opening days of the 20th century, you couldn't vote. If you were a black person living in um, Jim Crow South, you, you had legal barriers to you being able to advance. And you, you saw Marxism focused largely around class, I think, for that reason. I think what Gramsci recognized was that ultimately in civilizations which value things like upward economic mobility, free markets, um, you know, some degree of, of uh, you know, representation with respect to the way the decisions are made, that largely what ends up happening is, is social and economic upward mobility is, is significantly greater to achieve um, than arguably anything else that's been tried. And so that, that leaves a real problem for the left that want to consolidate and, and be in power. How, how, do you, how do you do this if the very countries that you're accusing for creating legitimate grievances are also the best at alleviating the legitimate grievances. So yeah, you can look at England at one point and you can look at like, Oh, this contributed, you know, immeasurably to the international slave trade. You're right. And you convinced England that it was wrong. And then they spent time, money and treasure shutting down the international slave trade for which they get no modern day recognition for. And so here's the real problem that, that the extreme left is facing right now. When they use legitimate grievances, they end up losing the very people that they're trying to consolidate in order to attain power because the societies that they're criticizing are better at addressing legitimate grievances than the Marxist societies they want to put in place. And so when they create kind of artificial grievances, that's almost much better for them because what's the cure for an artificial grievance? That never goes away. You can perpetuate that into infinity. You can expand it into infinity. Because now if you're not really oppressed in any sort of traditional understanding of that word, but you can be convinced that you're oppressed because somebody, anybody somewhere is doing marginally better than you. And the only way that you're ever going to get ahead if you get on board with the political coalition of all the other people that they've convinced are completely at a, a systemic disadvantage well then, yeah, the, the less their theory corresponds with reality, the more effective it becomes. And I didn't come up with that. That's not original to me. You, you go look at what, what Anthony um, Daniels said when he was studying communist propaganda. And he said the more he studied communist propaganda, the more he realized that it wasn't designed to inform. It was designed to manipulate and intimidate. And therefore, the less it corresponded with reality, the more effective it was because if you could convince someone to first remain silent in the face of obvious lies and then, even better, get them to repeat the lies, you essentially remove any sense of probity. You essentially make them a party to evil. And then the stance up of that was, well, a civilization of emasculated liars is very easy to control. And when he came to the conclusion, what is political correctness worked the same way and for the same reasons. They don't have to make it make sense because this isn't about creating a logically consistent or logically rigorous argument for some sort of outcome. You're an oppressor. They're oppressed. They need power. And it has to come at your expense. And there's absolutely nothing they can do to you that cannot be morally justified because you've been placed in that category. And so when you look back and you say, wait a second, I don't belong in this category, or wait a second, I didn't do that, or wait a second, this is inconsistent with this, they don't care. It's not essential to their objective. And, and because they believe their objective is not only necessary and inevitable, but moral, well, then you're a positive impediment. To dehumanize you is no longer an immoral act. It is a moral necessity to achieve the objective. And if you don't believe that's true, well, then go look at how this theory has played out in countries all over the world. Now, are, are there people on the right capable of engaging in, in, in bloodshed and violence and genocide? And Absolutely. But what we're seeing right now, what we're seeing right now at this particular point in world history is that the left, the extreme left, 
doesn't have a problem with this because when you try to, when you try to say, wait a second, that's logically inconsistent, they can just as easily say, oh, you mean, you mean systems of logic. You mean Western philosophy. That entity which was set up to oppress and hold up patriarchal systems at the expense of women and minorities. Right? Like, <laughs> well, then, of course, if you're going to throw out logic, if you're going to throw out logical consistency, and again, remember this, they do it selectively. They, will, they are happy to use logic all the way up to the point where it no longer sustains their argument, and then they will jettison it just as quickly and call you a racist for engaging in the sort of critical thinking they were doing five seconds ago until it didn't work for them anymore. But at that point, when you've, when you've taken that out, you've actually eliminated the possibility of peaceful discussion and actually arriving at a common conclusion that, you know what, maybe there is a better future that we can work for together. You have brought up a legitimate grievance. Let's go about fixing it. Well, gosh, as soon as you fix the legitimate grievance and you've done it in a way that no longer allows them to consolidate political power, that grievance doesn't work for them anymore. And that's where I think we're at right now. I think the reason why this extreme leftist viewpoint is increasingly going for grievances that are completely manufactured is because they're actually the most useful for them long term. And and again, if logic stands in the way, then logic will be jettisoned. And throwing out logic just means that the only way that we can adjudicate our differences anymore is through violence or surrender. Well, I got news for you. The Israelis aren't going to surrender. So, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to suffer as a result. And I don't mean because of the Israelis not surrendering. I mean because of people being willing to justify genocidal war crimes and murderous acts in order to achieve an objective, which even, they, like, whenever I saw that sign, Queers for Palestine, you know where that sign is not being held up? Palestine. <laughs> You're not going to see a lot of groups like that in Gaza walking around. Because I got news for you, if, 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 Hamas wins, you're not going to see a lot of pride parades going down Main Street in the Gaza Strip. That's not going to be a thing. It's currently not a thing, even though they haven't won. That that gets into the whole contradiction thing. Holding like like this is one of the biggest things that people on the center left and people on the center right just don't seem to understand is is how can you say you support you know the LGBTQ stuff and then also say I support Hamas and 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 you know support the Palestinians who are not exactly super pro trans and kids <laughs> yeah. like, and, and the reason that they can hold these contradictory views is because the left as a meme plex to try to achieve obtaining power and specifically political power, like you said, is simply geared towards uh, building whatever coalition they possibly can of the oppressed, either real or imagined in order to get enough numbers in order to, to, to seize power. And, Historically, that was appealing to the proletariat, right? That was the whole, you know, that was Lenin's whole playbook. That was Mao's whole playbook. Appeal mm -hmm. to the masses, appeal to, you know, the peasants in the fields, because there's more of them than there are of the capitalists and the bourgeoisie. But the problem is that class is malleable. Social mobility is a thing. The Industrial Revolution made people richer. And you could be born dirt poor and die a billionaire. That historically was not the case for thousands of years, right? It was only after the Industrial Revolution or after the advent of modern capitalism that you saw a degree of social mobil mobility that had previously not existed. And so the whole workers of the world unite, well, the worker of today might be the employee or so, sorry, employer of tomorrow, yeah. might be the business owner of tomorrow. And so that doesn't get the job done. And again, the job is not actually to free the oppressed. They're not the they're, they're they're not the green berets, right? That's not the, their job is not to free the oppressed. They're, they're, the objective is to obtain political power, and so if class isn't going to get the job done, well, they'll find something else. There'll always be somebody at the bottom of the rung, either through no fault of their own or because they made terrible personal decisions. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter if they've been genuinely oppressed. It doesn't matter if you're talking about the Jim Crow South or if you're talking about the drug addict on, you know, in 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 San Francisco who decided to destroy their their own life of their own choosing. It doesn't matter. The fact is, is that the left will appeal to either of them, again, for either real or imagined reasons. And reasonable people, people on the center left, people on the center right, will look at the actual injustices. They'll look at, again, Jim Crow South, for example, and they will say, I'm with you on that. Yeah. 
And so they, they will work to, to fight against those injustices where they, they see the government has actively discriminated against people and picked winners and losers based on things through no fault of their own. Again, Jim Crow South is a perfect example of that. This is also why you see classical liberals and center-right conservatives advocate against things like affirmative action within universities because they also see that as an injustice. But the left doesn't. And the reason why the left will, will on one hand, you know, protest against Jim Crow, but then on the other hand, say, we support Hamas murdering people or we support universities discriminating against people based on race and skin color is because ultimately they don't actually care about freeing the oppressed. They care about assembling a coalition that will give them political power. And so they will go to anybody that they think is low status, whether or not they actually are. And they will say, give us political power and I will give you the status you currently don't have. Either you currently don't have it because you're genuinely being oppressed, but you've already talked about how genuine oppression doesn't actually work for the left in the wrong, long run because you can solve that. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can actually lift things like Jim Crow. You can actually give voting rights to people. You can actually give civil liberties to people. You can give people economic freedom and opportunity. And at that point, when they're no longer actually genuinely oppressed, they have no need for the left anymore. And so the more, the, the genius approach is not actually to go to real genuine grievances. The real approach is to manufacture grievance yeah. and create a class of people who have nowhere to go other than the left and will never have anywhere to go other than the left. This is why you see the left full and fully embrace things like transgender ideology. Manufacturing more what what better way to create to, to create a dependent class than to manufacture a class of people that will have nowhere to go other than the left because they will never have status or power or wealth in any sort of sane society. I'm sorry, but if you think chopping children's genitals off is a rational approach to something, you will never succeed in any sort of meritocracy. You will never succeed in any sort of sane society. And so your only option is to go with the left because they don't care about meritocracy. And so I think that what you're seeing is the reason they hold these mutually contradictory views is because they see it not as an avenue to actually free the oppressed. They don't give a damn about these people. No, what they care about is political power. I think somebody tweeted it best old tweet, but somebody once said that, you know, communism is when weird deformed freaks make it illegal to be normal and then go out there and pillage and rape and loot and murder all the successful people in society. And everything else is just window dressing. Now, obviously it doesn't need to be physically ugly, but ugly in the sense of, of having the, the capacity and desire and will to commit unspeakable evil. And ultimately that's what you're dealing with. You're, you're dealing with people that believe that, that decolonization is actually everything that they accused colonization to be, except the only thing that they're adding is a self-righteous justification to do evil. Well, look, I know we've been at this for a while. It's a, it's a complex topic. Hopefully what we did here today is we, we gave it a somewhat decent background of a very, very brief history of, of all of the different countries and empires and civilizations that have existed in this part of the world. We've done a, a quick synopsis of, of what happened with respect to Hamas and Israel's response. Um, if I haven't already made this clear, let me make it clear again. I don't want any innocent people to get hurt. Um, I don't care what their ethnicity is. I don't care what their religion is. I want to make sure that innocent people stay protected. Um, Hamas attacked Israel on this point. And Israel has, I, I would say, not only the right to respond, I would say they have an obligation to respond. Because one of the things that I learned working in counterterrorism and being in combat is that if people are actually willing to hurt the innocent and kill the innocent and directly target and murder the innocent in order to achieve their political object objectives, they will not discover on their own that this is a horrible and immoral act unless they are made to discover it. And so, yes, I hope the IDF makes Hamas pay for this. I hope they do it in a way which, which hopefully eliminates civilian casualties. Because again, we don't want anyone innocent getting hurt. But people that are going to, people that are going to engage in these sorts of atrocities, no matter where they are, no matter who they are, no matter what their religious or political motivation, they have to be opposed. And I hope that they can come around to sound reasoning. But if they're not going to, if they choose violence is their mechanism for achieving their objectives, well, then at some point they're going to have to be met with violence. And it makes no sense to come in and step around and just say, well, no, I know that they conducted this evil act, but now we need the ceasefire. 
Well, I wonder if you'd feel that way if it was your home being bombed, if it was your family being carried off and used as a human shield. I'm willing to bet you won it. I'm certainly willing to bet the same leftists that believe that misgendering them is an act of violence wouldn't have put up with that sort of behavior if it was perpetrated against them. But as we've attempted to point out, the, one of the biggest conflicts that is going on right now is not just what's going on between Hamas and Israel right now, or Islam and Judaism. A large part of what's going on right now is an intellectual battle, and that battle is taking place largely in the left. And you are starting to see more people who fall within that traditional category of liberalism start to wonder what the heck has happened to the more extreme elements of the left. And I would say, I, I welcome your critique of the things that they're saying right now. And we need it to continue. Because diversity can be a strength if you have some unity of purpose and some unity around basic moral standards. But if you don't, then what you're going to get is a political ideology that essentially wipes out logic the moment it no longer works for them that manufactures grievance so that they can prey upon it and feed into it in order to consolidate power. And now what we're seeing is that they're willing to dismiss or even elevate any sort of act of violence that they think is necessary in order to consolidate that power. And my hope is that we will be able to continue to combat that intellectually in the United States in order to defeat it in the court of public opinion so that we don't have to defeat it by other means. Because ultimately, anybody that is not willing to peacefully coexist with you is telling you that they're willing to use violence. And I don't want it to ever come to that in the United States. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your comments and your interaction. I Hopefully we got to uh, everyone's question that we saw. Uh, again, I, I want to say thank you to uh, Good Ranchers. They, they, they make this possible. They make it possible for us to come and dedicate the time and do the research and, and hopefully provide you with a product that you find valuable through watching this podcast. And if you want to support what we're doing on this show, if you'd like to support the additional content that we try to put out there on a regular basis, then, hey, do something good for your family. Order up some, uh, order up a good meal and uh, use our promo code Nick and uh, show good ranchers that you appreciate what they're doing. And I promise you, you'll appreciate the product that they deliver. Once again, thank you very much. And we'll see you next episode.